is of the state or how to get shit done without killing each other, hopefully, hopefully, hopefully. Um, wishes were wings. Um, so if, if you've never heard of me before and you've never talked to me before, this is basically what I do. I do a lot of different stuff in uh, to promote free speech and circumvent censorship. I work on stuff like Motion Wireless, which you, you probably have seen around the conference a little bit. I also work on Cupcake. Um, I work on something called Stormy, which is a hidden service launcher for the Tor network. Um, and I also occasionally lend my time to the AIDS Policy Project, which is an amazing organization promoting AIDS research um, and things of that nature. All right, so collaboration is really fucking hard. You know, we've got like big personalities, we've got ideological issues, we've got logistical issues that will never really go away. Um, and on top of all those other things, we also have to deal with paranoia. So, no one in this room is Julian Assange. And Julian Assange is not Julian Assange. Um, if you've ever met him, you, you pretty much know what I'm talking about. Sorry, hold on a second. Laptop done. Yay, there it is. So I wrote up something, you know, I, I deal every day with people who are incredibly outlandishly paranoid for a variety of completely legitimate reasons. I know lots of people who get stopped every time they cross a border. I know people who spent 10 years getting, you know, special uh, special screens every time they flown domestically, um, even though they were born in America, even though they have done nothing wrong, they have no criminal record. Um, but, uh, you know, and I see a lot of people that sort of leave the circumvention tech community because they can't handle it. And on one level, I have to agree with that. I don't think that's healthy. I don't think that you should have to put up with this. Um, but, you know, to some extent, leaving the circumvented tech community because of paranoia is like leaving Grindr because you keep running into gay men. I mean, it's, it's such a feature of the landscape that you should probably accept it before you ever step foot in it, um, or at least be able to set some sort of, you know, personal boundaries, you know. So paranoia in this community results from serious abuse of power, both in government and in the private sector, and it's great to go in the other room and hear Google, you know, talk endlessly about how they really care about your privacy. Meanwhile, they're mining all of the data that passes through their systems in order to make money off of you. Um, so there's a bit of a trade-off there. But you also have to deal with, you know, government interference. People sending, you know, NSL requests for your data. You'll never find out about that. Um, unless you're actually like a known figure, it's incredibly unlikely you will ever know if there's been a secret order for your accounting. And you can't know. Everything is gagged. So, you know, again, it makes sense that people get kind of paranoid. Infiltration is a big issue. But I feel like, you know, the greatest threat to this community is the fact that we get so wrapped up in this, this drama and this suspicion about each other that it reduces our operational capacity remarkably. I mean, I think this is just something to consider. All right, so collaboration is hard. And we all deserve a lot of credit for not being, you know, paranoid psychopaths and dangerous criminals because we all probably could be, should be, after we spent five or ten years dealing with hackers and things like that. Um, but let's be real here. Big personalities. Let's start with that one. Let's be real. A lot of us have big personalities, and that's actually a real asset in a reader like this. We need to present and promote and explain and train people to use tools. And like we frequently work with people in dangerous areas like Texas. And this really helps to have sort of a big personality and like this 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 exuberance about us. Um, you know, with big flair and big personalities, frequently comes big egos and big drama. I'm not exempt from this. Um, I am sort of a drama magnet at times, and I try to dissipate it as much as I can, but that only works a little bit. Um, and I do have a little bit, a tiny, tiny bit of an ego, I think. You know, this is a thing that happens. This is not preventable. You will deal with people every day who, you know, are constantly concerned with either their image, or how they're perceived, or they want to be the center of attention. That's just a feature of the lens here. But, uh, you know, one thing to keep in mind is, like, the most contentious people in the space, they're just people. They have friends. They have fun. Like, these people are just people. They might take themselves super, super seriously, but they're not always that serious. And this is, this is actually a great shot of the, the first meeting of the Tor Sweater Club. There were literally like five developers walking around with these crazy ass Icelandic sweaters. It was actually really amazing. I'm gonna leave that up because I love that photo. Um, 
so don't take don't take everybody too seriously. Um, so let's yeah, big personalities, big personalities, big contention. Lots of people hate each other. Okay, whatever. Let's talk about the art model. This is actually important. So the art model is accelerated research collaboration, and it's used a lot in the biomedical sciences. And by a lot, I mean it's been used pretty successfully, but it hasn't gotten this broad adoption. Um, people like the Myelin Research Foundation use this all the time, and to amazing success, which I'll talk about in a moment. But the gist is, with the ARC model, you take two researchers from different labs, you force them to work together. Remember, these people have been you know, competitors maybe 20 years. They're all at the top of their field. They're all really competitive. They've been fighting for the same grants, fighting for the same money, fighting for the same publications for decades. They fucking hate each other. But you force them to work together. You give them a big grant to do so. You make them share data. And somewhere in this process, some magic happens. A lot of times, you know, years of resentment and frustration just sort of dissipate. But on top of everything else, they're making huge advances. Um, you know, when the Myelin Repair Foundation was founded in 2002, um, the founder of it had been told, you know, it could be like 50 years before a multiple sclerosis, you know, drug is on the market that will effectively treat you. And he was like, that's not acceptable. So he wanted to actually put this into place make some stuff happen, and actually it's worked quite well. Multiple sclerosis research has advanced dramatically in the last seven years. Just want to point that out. So you've got an exponentially accelerated research. You're coming up with innovative solutions. In medicine, it's drugs. I think that with circumvention tech, it's most likely going to be, you know, you know, better tour. It's going to be, you know, on Saturday, David Fitfield, who writes Flash Proxy, who, who works on a lot of Tor network stuff, he wrote a pluggable transport to incorporate Lantern with Tor. So if you're using Tor and Tor doesn't work anymore, you can use Lantern as a fallback. These are two competitors. They're working together. They made something amazing. This can save people's lives. You know, sometimes it really helps to just move beyond what you think your circumstances are and this competitive nature that's in the community. And I actually just explained how this works. All right, so there's kind of a funny story with this. Um, you know, we have a lot of ideological issues that sort of like clash. Like, you know, a lot of us are anarchists, and a lot of us are kind of capitalists, and we've got like startups in the mix, and businesses, and we've got policy people, and you know, then all these anarchists are taking money from the State Department, and how does that make you feel, and you know, all this other stuff. Um, so let's fight about it. <laughs> I mean, there's, uh, you know, if you're in AIDS activism, there's a lot of really great stories about people. And um, one of them, you know, about 20 years ago, um, two people with, who were really heavy in the space in San Francisco, and they just, they were basically at the end of their lives, and they had advanced HIV disease. Um, and one was an anarchist, and one was a socialist. They got into a fucking fist fight, and broke each other's faces <laughs> over ideology. So, you know, part of the struggle is about how to keep people who are actively dying from killing each other over ideological differences. And I'm not sure I have a solution for that. But I think that it's worth noting that this is not just a, um, a hacker, circumvention tech, liberation tech situation. I think this occurs everywhere. But we need to at least try to move past it. Um, skill set compatibility. This is actually a tender issue for a lot of people. You know, have you ever out, outgrown a project? Like, have you ever started on the ground floor of something and you're like, you know, this is actually kind of like, I've grown beyond this project. I need to focus on larger things. Um, has the project outgrown you? Um, you know, I was like one of the first people to test CryptoCat. And two years hence, the project totally outgrew me, like all the way. And so it's kind of tricky to like navigate this thing of, yes, I really like you, yes, I really like your project, but we're in two totally different spaces. So I think the key here is actually consider alternative ways of collaborating. Um, you know, if something gets totally rewritten in Python and all you know is PHP, and you have a substantial, you know, history with the project, can you do community stuff? Are you a designer? Can you just give moral support and be like, hey, you guys are doing a kick-ass job. If you need somebody to test, let me know. Just 
work on different ways of collaborating. Over communicate and say, I think that it's time that I, you know, worked in some other fashion, or I think that it, the project should be like this if you do think that way, or you know, things like that. And I think the key thing here, I see this all the time. Don't lose a friendship over stupid open source bullshit. It's like, if you can maintain friendships over the course of like five or ten years, you'll find that they actually you know, go way beyond projects. You can collaborate in different ways. You might stop collaborating entirely, but still remain friends and still be open and active in the space independently. And there are logistical issues. I had someone ask me recently, why don't we communicate by a pond? Like, really? So, you know, for those of you who don't know, Pond is actually a highly, highly technical, highly unusable, highly unstable piece of encryption software that is very difficult to actually get going as a thing. Um, and then you can communicate at odd intervals and things like that. It's, it's nice, but you, you can't really manage a project that way. So I want to give some tips on logistical issues for both project owners and for, um, excuse me, and for volunteers. For project owners, break down project needs into tiny bits. If you say, we need, to, we need graphics, what does that look like? Do you need a logo? Do you need a whole website design? Do you need print design? It sounds obvious, but you need to break down exactly what you need and want. Otherwise, you'll have somebody making like a how-to guide, giving you PDFs, and giving you PSD files, and you're like, great, I'll never use this. But you never explained what you actually wanted to get out of that. Um, be respectful of others' time. A lot of people have a lot, have a lot of different needs. A lot of people, you know, in this space are getting older, they're getting married, they're having kids. They have less time. So for them to give, you know, 20 hours in a week to, to your project is actually a really big deal. Um, you have to be conscientious of other people's needs. Definitely set boundaries. If you have someone who is doing all the things, they might not need to be doing all the things if you don't want them to sort of take over your project in really interesting ways. Um, give kudos liberally. Reward good work. I mean, some people give out little glowing balls on the floor, and some people give out RC cars and planes. Some people give out Nintendo DS's. You know, some people just high five you and say, you know what, that was really fucking awesome. You did a good job. Thank you. Over communicate. If you have concerns, let them know. If you have, if you have questions that you, you think that should be answered, ask them. This is not going to happen automatically. Um, and be flexible and aware of chaos theory. I'm telling you now, the physicists were right. And no one advance. Is volunteer anonymity okay? Um, Mike Perry just came in. I don't know if Mike Perry's his real name, and I'm kind of okay with that. Not everybody is, though. Ah, wait, there it goes. Okay, hold on a second. This is cool. I talk to people all the time who are like, this is, th th my project is so complicated, they'll never get it. They'll never get it. So this is actually really cute, um, and you'll see you'll see what it is. But you can break down anything into small bits. which is a very complicated proxying system um, that creates bridges for the Tor network, which is itself incredibly complicated. And, I mean, I feel your pain, is what I'm saying. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff! No, just click on it. Okay, great. So, 
volunteers, it's, it's about as complicated as it is for project owners, believe it or not. You have to know what your limitations are. Are you going to have to learn a whole other library if you want to implement this feature for this project? What happens if you do it wrong? What happens if you, you learn the library, but then you know, your feature isn't all that great, or it isn't necessary, or it, you know, something like that? So sort of try to plan your work out in advance. Um, I've fallen into this trap like a thousand times, so I, I totally get it. Be flexible. Projects change rapidly. You know, their goals today might, be, that might not be their goals a year from now. And the way that they have everything coded today might not be the way they have it coded six months from now. And they may want to be based in Berlin like next month, because obviously Berlin's the place to be. Um, know in advance how much credit you want. It's like, do you want to work on a project long term? Do you want to be like a core contributor? Do you want to be on the website? Do you care about credit at all? Um, do you want to be totally anonymous? Um, you know, do you have to be anonymous? You know, are you expecting to get hired or paid because of your work on the project? Either by that project or another project? Are you expecting to make your name a name for yourself based on your contributions to the community? Um, don't remain silent if you have concerns, either about a project or how it's run or anything like that. Um, letting that kind of like, you know, those questions fester and that resentment build up will just cause huge problems. And if there is a huge concern that you have and you don't get it resolved, you may find out later that your concerns were actually valid and you should have gotten out earlier. I've seen it happen. It, it's a thing. And don't max out your available time. None of you will ever follow that advice. But I'm just telling you, we're all at like 100% capacity. But we need it to be at less than 80% capacity. You know, you need to become the master of no. And that's easier said than done, and I get that. Um, you are the one that decides your own priorities, and you need to stick to them. That's not just good for you, that's good for the projects you work on. That's good for your free time, your friends, and your family. Um, and plan for the unplanable. Build in empty space into your schedule. Chaos theory. The physicists were right. So there have actually been like just an endless number of random unplanned things that have occurred around me um, and various people that I work with. Like, you know, someone you're working with on a project might lose their visa. They might not get a visa. Um, someone could have a kid like spontaneously. Um, I'm going through a custody process right now, and two months ago that wasn't the case because I don't have children. So, you know, having all these various things that will send you way beyond 100% time if you're maxing out your time. Um, also, a really funny story that I found out yesterday was uh, on, a, on a big open source project, they had an anonymous contributor that nobody who knew who this person was. Um, and what happened was that their laptop and their backup drive and the USB keys were sitting on the same table for a few hours, and the sprinklers came on. So basically they disappeared into the ether, and couldn't prove who they were, and didn't really reach out for a couple of months. So then, you know, this person who has deliverables and deadlines and things that they've agreed to do just sort of stopped existing for a couple of months. That's really tricky, that's really hard to navigate. So. You know, just plan for the unplanable, give yourself extra time and space, um, and definitely keep up, a, keep a backup drive somewhere that isn't on your table, preferably a waterproof safe. Um, and other than that, I am going to open the floor for questions. Which there are none of. Yes. All right. Oh, yeah, you have to ask a question. Lead cover. I got nothing. <laughs> okay, okay. Sorry. That's all right. Do you even know what this talk is? No. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> all right, so. Wait, oh. how, much, how much time do you have? How much time do you have for the session? Oh. I was going to say zero because I, got, I felt like two two thirty. Yeah, 230 is when the next session starts. So. Do you, so, from this past weekend, was the value-based design workshop good for getting past those differences in ideology and other things? That's what it's supposed to do. And it's okay if it didn't. But I would like to hear some tools and approaches to doing these things rather than just recommendations. Well, you know, I mean, you make an excellent point, which is, which is I do believe that the workshop helped. Um, but I think that most of the, most of the things that help are simply putting yourselves in an environment where you can see someone is well-rounded. Um, if you have to work right next to someone for like two days, 
you're less likely to think that, that you know, they're horrible or untenable or, you know, I just can't work with this person or they're just awful and I can't talk to them at all than if you only exist on LibTech with that person. Or if you only meet them, like, once in a coffee shop and they're a jerk because they're having a bad day. You know. Um, first impressions don't, aren't always, like, the core of things. And, you know, I, I think that seeing people as well-rounded is the best, is the closest thing you're going to get. And if it takes a workshop to do that, then it does. And if it takes a gutter-led facilitation group to do that, then it does. And if it you know, requires you all to go to you know, Hawaii as part of Whisper Systems, then it does. You know, these are all things that sort of artificially shove people together in interesting configurations. Um, and sometimes some really amazing collaborations come out of that. Um, and sometimes they don't. But usually they do. So I think that's all. I think I talked, talked at top speed for half an hour. No questions. So you're all free to go if you search.